Welcome, and thank you all for coming to day two of Unison's 2021 Summit. We are very glad that you have chosen, chosen to join us. Before we get started with today's keynote, I have two short announcements. First of all, I want to thank the folks behind the scenes from Unison who have truly made this conference a success. Mariah Aguilar, Eric Goins, Sarah Hofstetter, and Glenda Genscher make it all happen. They provide the organizational support that have enabled us to go virtual this year and do it with our biggest attendance ever. It is also my honor to announce that Unison will be sponsoring free registration and $1,000 in travel reimbursement as part of the newly established John Johnston Unison Memorial Fellowship Fund. From its founding, John was a very active member in the Unison teaching and learning community, particularly in the area of learning analytics. He was instrumental in developing the vision for the Unison data platform and in orchestrating institutional and Unison resources to make it a reality. He was, he was a leading conceptual and technical driver for the My Learning Analytics product and he helped to organize our learning analytics community for information sharing, hackathons, and ongoing engagement. John also significantly enhanced our community's relationship with our first LMS provider, Instructure, who's our sponsor today, and organized several joint strategy and feedback sessions, workshops, and conference presentations. John hailed from the University of Michigan, and he epitomized that institution's leaders and best ethos. As an active consortium contributor, he had an amazing willingness to share, to reach out and involve others. And in doing so, his efforts were multiplied. John made us all better. John led with infectious enthusiasm, deep subject matter expertise, and a persuasive influence. He was an amazing academic technology professional. And through this memorial fellowship, that we seek, we seek to encourage those qualities that he embodied as part of our membership and as part of a consortium contributor. Each year that Unison has an on-site summit, Unison will call for fellowship nominations from within the Unison teaching and learning community for members who like John contribute to our community through their leadership, their engagement and vision. And during these difficult times, it's important that we rally around our shared mission to make sure that we share our values and indeed what it need, needs to be unison. So I look forward to calling for those fellowship proposals next year. And now our platinum sponsor, Instructor's Chief Experience Officer, Melissa Lobel will introduce today's keynote. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. And what an incredible opportunity to honor such a leader in our industry. Um, we thank you for that and we look forward to participating in any way we can. So with no more further ado, I have the honor of introducing an incredible keynote presenter today. Kenneth K Kadinger is a professor of human computer interaction and psychology at Carnegie Mellon University. Dr. Kadinger has a master's degree in computer science, a PhD in cogn cognitive psychology, and experience teaching in an urban high school. His multidisciplinary background supports his research goals of understanding human learning and creating educational technologies that increase student achievement. His research has contributed new principles and technologies for the design of educational software and has produced basic cognitive science research results on the nature of student thinking and learning. Katinger directs Learn Lab, which started with 10 years of National Science Foundation funding and is now the scientific arm of Carnegie Mellon University's Simon Initiative. Learn Lab builds on the past success of cognitive tutors, an approach to online personalized learning that is in use in thousands of schools and has been repeatedly demonstrated to increase student achievement. For example, doub doubling what algebra students learn in a single school year. He was co-founder of Carnegie Learning Incorporated that has brought cognitive tutor-based courses to millions of students since it was formed in 1998 and leads Learn Lab, now that scientific arm of Carnegie Mellon's Simon Initiative. Dr. Kadinger has authored over 250 peer-reviewed publications, 
and has been a proud investigator on over 45 grants. In 2017, he received, received the Hillman Professor of Computer Science, and in 2018, he was recognized as a Fellow of Cognitive Science. Welcome, Dr. Kadinger. Thank you so much, Melissa. I'm very happy to be here and, and looking forward to uh, uh, this opportunity to engage uh, the Unison audience here. Um, excited to uh, have a chance to, to, to uh, present on the uh, things we've been doing and, and hope to invite you to uh, engage in uh, making use of some of the resources that the National Science Foundation has uh, and uh, so generous to help us build. Um, and I hope you can uh, see my screen share now um, in my, my slide presentation. Learning analytics is not a spectator sport. Uh, Melissa, can sure you? Can. Yep, great, okay. Yep. Um, so uh, I will uh, dive right in and, and give you a preview of, of what I'm gonna present today. I first wanna talk about how you know, much of the course design that we do uh, is based on our own expert self-reflection, our reflection on our expertise. And I wanna suggest that that has limits because in fact, there's pretty good research to suggest that most of what we know, we don't know we know, we don't have conscious awareness of. Um, and as such, there's real benefits to using data to help dig into what we really know and need to learn to become an expert. Um, and also to use educational technologies uh, um, as much my career has been involved in, in doing to, to help create interactive learning by doing experiences. And while those learning by doing experiences are powerful, I think the real digital revolution in education is gonna is gonna come through the availability of data for all involved, data back to students for feedback, data to instructors to improve their teaching, data to course developers to improve, improve their courses, data to learning scientists to improve the science. Uh, I'll give you an, a more extended example of one of our learning analytic investigations where we, we probe some of the ideas in a massive open online course in a MOOC. Um, and then finally, uh, give a, uh, some overview of some of the available resources we have for data and analytics sharing, as well as for um, uh, supporting you in, in learning to participate in learning analytics. Um, so let me first start by giving um, a, a little bit of background on the work we did in creating online interactions, bringing AI to bear, as Melissa mentioned in the introduction. So we developed these cognitive tutors and way back in the early 90s began to field those um, in, in schools and, and widely disseminate them. And it's just a full course, many different activities, but many of the activities involve students engaging in an analysis of authentic problem scenarios where they're going to uh, build models of those problem scenarios using multiple representations like this, this spreadsheet table um, kind of activity. And as they're working through uh, um, the problem scenario and using this representation, there's an AI intelligent tutoring agent that's tracking their performance and able to give feedback. For example, here when the students entered an expression for the uh, cost of one of these two plans that's ignoring the monthly uh, uh, fixed cost and only acknowledging the per minute cost. So this kind of embedded instruction during doing is, is particularly powerful. And it, it comes not only in the form of feedback, but also um, in the context of asking students challenging questions, like when do these two functions um, intersect? Uh, and if students, need help in those cases, they need some instruction, they can ask for hints and, and the hints will walk them through um, how to set up an equation to find that intersection point. Uh, the one key idea here is that learning by doing, this isn't discovery learning, this isn't instead of getting information through text or through lecture, but it's about having information come at a time when you need it most and will, when it'll be relevant to making a decision um, and so that's, these are key forms of adaptivity to learners that are in these kinds of systems. 
Another one is more longer term and it goes to how important it is to get deliberate practice to develop expertise and in that deliberate practice to get tasks that are tailored at the edge of a student's competence. And, and that's another feature of the AI in these systems. Um, so lots of evaluations over the years of these systems and start, starting with some quasi experiments uh, we did in the, in the 90s in the Pittsburgh public schools, but through to um, there was a very large uh, randomized field trial of these systems in uh, done in 140 uh, schools where uh, half of them, 70, were randomly assigned to use the cognitive tutor algebra course. And I just showed you the technology component of that course, which represents about two days a week of student activity. But there was a consumable text that we developed based on learning science and data um, and professional development for teachers that were part of the whole package. And um, especially in the second year of implementation, there were powerful effects of, of, of this cognitive tutor uh, uh, algebra course in comparison to the control groups where those schools continued to do their traditional algebra approach. Essentially, this graphic illustrates that over the school year, uh, students' uh, achievement was uh, doubled um, if they were in the cognitive tutor algebra course as, a, as in comparison to their growth in their traditional algebra course. So um, a key to the success here is to use data to drive design. And to give you an example of that, early in the design process here, I, I wanted to better understand um, students' uh, uh, challenges they experience with uh, story problems in algebra. And uh, we built this assessment design where um, I created a, a number of matched triples like this. We noticed that these all three of these problems involve the same underlying mathematics, but they're presented as a story. and as an equation. And um, my ingoing hypothesis here in straightforward uh, analysis of, of the underlying thinking was that, well, you solve the story problem by translating it to the equation. So um, my thought is that the story problem would be hardest. And we later uh, formally interviewed math educators to confirm that they too, that like 90% of them say either the story or the word problem is hardest for students. But what we actually found is that the equations are the hardest, that the lowest percent correct uh, uh, we observed was in the, for the equation problems. And this was quite striking um, and, and a finding that we ended up replicating a number of different times, including identifying boundary conditions where in fact the uh, equations are easier than story problems in certain contexts. But um, what it revealed to us and what the more general important point here is that uh, we that the data often gives us insights that go beyond our self reflection of what's going on. Um, there was this belief about the difficulty of story problems that uh, essentially underestimates the difficulty that students have in learning the foreign language of mathematics of algebra here. And indeed, that notion of thinking about it as a as a language is powerful because I think you may accept that much of what you learn in a natural language is outside of your conscious awareness, at least wasn't explicitly taught. Nobody explained um, how to say use the in a sentence. You acquire that through experience, through practice and through feedback. But because of so much of our expertise is acquired in this way, tacitly, there's a kind of blind spot that experts may have. They may not be able to see the hidden skills that uh, novice students need to acquire, and the data can help reveal those hidden skills. And uh, back when we discovered this, we were calling this expert blind spot. But as, as I already alluded to, there's evidence that it's much bigger than a blind spot. There's a lot of what we uh, know in our expertise that we don't know we know. So, um, in the early 2000s, we began to uh, apply these ideas to uh, higher education, um, which of course, um, we're here to especially talk about. And um, you may have uh, seen a talk yesterday by Norman Beer, who directs our open learning initiative here at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and I wanna give some examples in the context of it, starting with um, 
some studies on OLI, uh, the OLI statistics course that was developed. And again, randomized field trial um, in the context of, of real teaching um, involving in this case, the same instructor um, taught a traditional version of the course. Uh, he had been teaching for years in a full semester, 100 hours uh, of instruction over that full semester. And that was compared with um, a data-driven design, redesigned OLI course that was more adaptive and more focused on providing both students and the instructor with, with data on their performance, lots of formative assessment questions. And I'll illustrate some of the, those in, the, uh, in a moment. But the striking thing about this experiment was the uh, previous results had suggested that learning was being accelerated enough that they could teach the same course in half a semester and do at least as well in terms of educational outcomes. And what they found um, is that they actually got better examples on the final exam not shown, but also on a, a pretty challenging uh, uh, independent test of conceptual understanding of calculus where um, the learning gains were much higher, even though uh, students in the adaptive course spent uh, half the time uh, to get there. So a pretty impressive outcome. Um, um, so I'm gonna get, go back to probe a little bit this notion of risks of course design via reflection and suggest that um, the way to enhance our reflection is through a set of techniques that get at the underlying thinking process, the underlying cognition needed to perform uh, tasks in a domain in an expert way. And for my money, uh, there's many ways to enhance instruction, but this is probably the most powerful one of all. Um, and it involves, often involves discovering new learning goals, new uh, hidden skills that are required of expertise that then redesigns can be done towards those new goals to improve the courses. And there's lots of different methods for uh, doing cognitive task analysis. Some are more qualitative, some are more quantitative, like the one I illustrated with assessment experiments in algebra above. Uh, they produce better learning and uh, Richard Clark, an educational psychologist has done a great job at documenting across a number of different studies, uh, large effects uh, of, of this approach in redesigning courses and then again, running controlled randomized, randomized assignment field experiments to compare. One of the ones that is particularly impressive was done in a med school where the control condition, again, you know, you, in a med school, they, they're very focused on uh, highly effective and efficient instruction, but they were designing their instruction based on, on, on expert self-reflection. And what Clark discovered, he used interview techniques to do cognitive task analysis, is that these experts, when, they, when you ask them, how do you do catheter insertion surgery, they give a description of a procedure which actually has lots of holes in it. And through probing those experts and saying, well, how did you do that? Why did you put the catheter in the neck this time? Whereas last time you put it in the back, um, probing to find out what are the conditions and cues that lead to different decisions in different contexts. They were able to discover a number of things that weren't being explicitly taught in the course and they weren't being practiced in the course. And by identifying those new learning goals and by building more deliberate practice activities, they dramatically increased these surgeons' performance. And they demonstrated it not only in final exams in the course, but they followed these uh, medical interns out into the field and, show, and, and uh, identified that their performance in the field was much better as a consequence. So why does this, this work? Well, this back to this idea that uh, that Clark articulated this 70% rule, which is much more than a blind spot that, that we uh, had thought about in our early algebra work, that about 70% of what experts know is tacit. It's outside their direct awareness. Um, what we are consciously aware of, of what we know, what we know we know is the tip of the, uh, of the iceberg, and we need techniques to, to probe underneath. And, and I would suggest that this applies very widely. Um, I think it's maybe most intuitive within first language acquisition, but I think it, 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 this idea um, applies widely to most of, if not all of what we teach in higher education. Um, so um, that's uh, because so much tacit learning is going on, learning by doing is super important. And perhaps you're already convinced of that, but I, I think 
uh, general practice isn't quite there. So we need more evidence in this regard. And, and um, we've been doing learning and that analytics as a line of, 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 of work on my team has been exploring this. And, um, and we had a particularly nice opportunity to do this um, kind of exploration because of a, a, a massive open online course, a MOOC that was created um, in psychology that used OLI materials. And we approached this analysis uh, with a number of research questions, including does this interactive learning by doing improve uh, a, um, a MOOC and does it work outside of math, um, like in psychology, for example, in, in humanities domains? Um, do students vary in how they choose to learn? In, the, in these online learning situations, they're often given multiple different resources from video lectures to online text to formative assessment activities. Which do they choose most? And do, do different students make different choices? And does it matter for their learning outcomes what choices they make? Um, so uh, in this uh, uh, MOOC, uh, there were Coursera features, the typical uh, video lectures, discussion forums. There were writing assignments and surveys. And as summative assessments for each of the 11 uh, units in the course chapter length units, there were a quiz for each one and a final exam. Um, on the OLI side, there was this expository content in, in uh, which we'll call reading. So there's students can choose to watch lectures, read expository content that, that involves texts and examples, images, video clips, illustrating um, psychological phenomena. They also engage in interactive doing, which you know, are questions that importantly have feedback and are designed to especially give feedback uh, on misconceptions that prior data analysis reveals students have. And, and often these misconceptions go to things that uh, experts aren't fully aware of. So having data to identify those and then the right good questions that, uh, for example, in multiple choice, correspond with things that make sense to students that, that they actually would say in an open-ended context. And we have another project that's working on techniques to mine open-ended answers to create these kinds of interactive uh, um, selection-based uh, activities online. Um, also hints are available. <coughs> so um, I'll illustrate these in a second, but I, I do also wanna emphasize that all of this is done through a backward design approach that um, uh, involves iterative uh, development of these activities, but also articulations of uh, 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 explicit learning objectives. And you'll see that in the examples in a moment. So on the MOOC side, video lectures, this the Georgia Tech professor um, and, and, and his slides. And in the log data here, we're able to you know, count, uh, um, monitor how often students are you know, clicking on the play button in these videos and, and watching the videos. Um, similarly, we can track how much online reading they're doing as they uh, scroll and click through pages um, in each of the units of the course. And each of the units had multiple modules. And again, each, each of them um, has explicitly out, uh, articulated learning objectives, learning goals that the, the text and the questions are being designed for. Um, here's an example of one of those. Um, let me show it in a, in a video. Um, so uh, here we see the students have been prompted to, to do a self-report measure on per personality. And now there's a series of questions engaging their understanding of the div different dimensions here. And as you can see, they, can, they get feedback when they make errors. They can ask for hints um, when they get when they make errors and ask for hints, they're explanatory. They explain what's wrong. They explain why what's right is right. And you know, uh, students can then make alternative choices here compared to the other alternatives on the screen. Is it sympathetic, soft-hearted? Uh, no, oh, hardworking, ambitious, that seems right. And now they not only get positive feedback, but explanatory feedback um, uh, uh, stating why that, that's the right answer. Um, so these kinds of interactive activities, again, uh, aren't about discovery learning. It's not free, open, uh, construct all your knowledge on their own. There's still instruction here, but the instruction's coming in reaction to students doing. 
Um, and the hypothesis here is that students will process that instruction more deeply and in a way that their brains will retain it more in the long run. Um, so uh, we uh, have other kinds of examples, like this is a drag and drop around labeling parts of the brain. There's also um, a whole set of activities uh, in, in many of these modules around applying uh, what you've learned in, in various scenarios where there might be a problem and how would you apply the psychology to the problem. Some of those are presented in multiple choice, but others are in this open-ended submit and compare form uh, where students uh, enter their own open-ended response, click submit and compare, and then can see an expert response and compare their response to it. Sometimes there's then follow up multiple choice questions to help make sure the student um, saw the appropriate features when, when they compared their solution to the expert one. Uh, so um, this data set uh, it was typical of MOOCs where a lot of people sign up, you know, maybe just to poke around to see what the content is without any real intention of going on. Um, uh, you know, drop off from like even the first quiz, uh, only about 50% of those involved took the first quiz and it dropped off from there. Um, we see that the, the, they had an option to register or not in using the OLI materials and, and the students that chose to re register and using the OLI materials did end up participating about twice as much more across all the quizzes. Um, you know, even though there's this typical um, drop off, the sample of students that took the final exam is still quite large, approaching 1000 students. And that's what we focused on in the subsequent analysis here. So um, do these learning by doing activities improve the MOOC? Well, students who registered in it participated more. Um, this is not an experimental finding. This could be uh, um, uh, a selection effect, of course. Um, uh, they learned more, same potential criticism there. Um, in this kind of data, though, we, we often have uh, other demographic and background predictor variables. Like, for example, we controlled for performance on the first quiz as well as on a pretest, and both of those are highly predictive of the final exam. Um, but not, even when controlling for those other predictors, this relationship held. Um, so we see, you know, some evidence, not as strong as a randomized field trial, but, but pretty good evidence that learn by doing is effective in the psychology course, as well as the prior results in math. And this is just with a pretty rough variable. Did you register to use OLI or not? What we can now look at is, did you actually use the OLI features or did you use the MOOC features or did you use both? So um, we, uh, the log data we had from students' interactions allowed us to essentially count for each student, how many videos they watched, how many pages they, they read. Um, in both cases, we're really estimating, right? We don't know how much they were attending as they uh, hovered over these, um, uh, but uh, uh, presumably that variation is, 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 is common across users. Um, and then the third dimension is how many of those questions uh, did they engage in? And median splits on all of these create eight different categories. And you can see that a, stamp, a substantial number of students were low in all three, in the low half of all three. Um, some students were low in video watching, low in reading, but high in doers. These, these are the ones that like to act, right? Um, and then the six other categories are shown here. High in all three was uh, more over 180 students. Um, this bar here, 120 students were essentially primarily OLI users. They read on the high half, they did on the high half, but they were low in watching. And this bar, the blue bar over here is substantially uh, uh, MOOC uh, features, just watching the videos, but not reading as much and not doing as much. So yes, students vary in their choices. We have at least 60 students in all, uh, all eight of these categories. What about learning outcomes? So we can look at quiz total. I'm just starting with the low watchers and low uh, readers and contrasting low versus high doer. We see a big effect there. Students, even without watching all of the videos or, all of the, or doing all of the readings, performing at above 90% on the quiz if they did the multiple uh, um, 
in line formative assessment activities, uh, just a little above 60% if they didn't. Um, similar results across the board. So here we introduce high watching, um, and, but which brings up the, the score video watching. More video watching does indeed seem to help here, but again, uh, an extra boost from more doing, extra boost in red here from more doing. Um, even in the uh, high watching and high reading category, doing is an additional boost. So um, it indeed had the greatest impact on, on quiz scores, uh, more so than watching and reading. And this was also true of the final exam as well as the quizzes. So yes, we do see variability and yes, it does seem to matter for learning outcomes. And, and let me show you in somewhat more detail how it matters. So um, this is a causal modeling uh, output from a tool called Tetrad, which is available in our, uh, in our tools um, in LearnSphere. Um, and let me walk you through how this works. Um, the Tetrad searches your, your database of variables for possible correlations and then makes inferences about co possible causal relationships, perhaps with some guidance to you about what happened in what order. Um, and it's reporting standardized reg regression coefficients, which in this case, um, a, a standard deviation better performance on the pretest implies a 0.25 standard deviation better performance on the quiz. Um, so controlling for that, what happens when we look at variation in lecture watching? Well, that does have a positive effect, but it's a pretty small one. Um, and same for reading, um, positive, statistically reliable, but 0.06 effect size. Um, in contrast, the doing has quite a large effect size, 0.44, and um, that uh, impact was more than six times uh, the impact on uh, doing from, from playing or non act uh, these. Uh, uh, reading uh, So learning by doing is powerful. There's lots of other science about that. There's research that um, um, even geniuses in domains uh, um, like like the Beatles or Bill Gates in programming um, uh, or, or Wayne Gretzky in hockey, they, they spend many years developing their expertise, many hours of deliberate practice to get there. Um, there's many experimental results in addition to the tutoring systems results have been indicated. It's been a lot of research in the past 10 years or so on active learning in domain content like uh, physics education researchers in particular. In the psychology literature, there's this uh, notion of the testing effect that your long-term memory is much more enhanced by engaging in retrieval practice rather than restudy. Um, all these indicate the power of learning by doing. Yet we still see students and instructors uh, persisting in emphasizing lecture and reading. And I, and I think we, we need more results and we need them in more domains and, and you can help. So, um, uh, you know, we, we want to get beyond the per passive learning that's so pervasive uh, in higher ed to put more emphasis, you know, not just on creating online videos of our lectures, but on creating really high quality data driven uh, interactive experiences. Um, so uh, the last piece of my uh, talk then, uh, I want to address um, how we can use learning analytics and how you might engage in, in it. Um, through support from NSF, we've built uh, an infrastructure, actually two infrastructures, one for data sharing called Data Shop, where there's now over 3,000 educational technology data sets. They're from online courses at multiple levels, a lot of, lot of higher education, uh, some middle school, high school, even some at, at, uh, um, elementary. There are intelligent tutoring systems, online courses, there's educational game data, a wide variety of data, data simulation interaction. Um, and there's a set of web-based tools for analytics of these kinds of interactions. <clears throat> in addition, we've built uh, a, a web-based environment for sharing analytics. And in particular, um, in both cases, by the way, we're building communities of users for through educational opportunities that I'll talk about in a moment. But um, a key tool in this case is our 
um, web-based workflow authoring tool where um, the user community, um, my, my own programming staff, but many others have been contributing new analytic components that anyone can go, both of these are free and open. You can drag out these components uh, here to build a workflow by connecting an input component with various analysis components. There's all transformation, data transformation components and visualization components. There are reporting components. All of them have a, a gear controller that allows you to set options. So just as you might have experienced, you know, with uh, WYSIWYG uh, graphical user interface editors for doing statistical analysis, you can set up uh, the options on a, on a particular analysis the way you want, but without having to program. If you are a, a builder of analytics, you can add your analytic to this, uh, to this system by um, by uh, uh, um, submitting your code and, we, and, and ways to build components in any language actually, whether it's R or Python or C or, and so forth. And then they can be shared with each other. Um, uh, I wanted to say, you know, one of the reasons why this is so, so important is there's a lot of literature on different ways to teach, but there really are so many different ways to teach that there's so much room for further investigation. Um, so being involved with uh, such an analytics is, is something we really want to encourage. And we're trying to support this. Um, we have lots of different kinds of uh, analytics available through LearnSphere and, it, and it's growing as we speak. Um, here's one where we extended this doer effect from that psychology course to other courses in biology and information sciences and um, just popping up one of the regression analyses, again, showing a six times effect um, across these uh, different contexts. Again, we're seeing that uh, the power of doing over reading is, is, is large and, and, and clear across these domains. So um, um, I invite you to uh, engage in using these tools directly if you want to have an extended experience in, in learning how to use those and, and engaging with others in collaborative projects. Uh, we're doing our annual Learn Lab Summer School uh, this summer, July 26th through 30th. You can go to learnlab.org to apply for that. Um, and uh, I'd lo love to see you all there. Um, so uh, to summarize, uh, course design via expert reflection alone, it does not work well because so much of what we know, we don't know we know. Um, uh, uh, Data can help us improve uh, our learning in these domains. Uh, learning is not a spectator sport. Learning analytics doesn't need to be a spectator sport either. You can make use of these tools and attend our summer school. So uh, um, I, uh, um, that, that's, that, that's my summary. I see there are some questions in chat, um, which I will try to navigate to here. Um, and and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, wish I could be there all, all day with you, um, uh, definitely face to face. I see a, there are a number of questions about, um, uh, about how, whether you can share with us uh, questions that we can use with instructors to help do a deep dive into those uh, tasks instructors. Uh, don't know what they know. Yeah, well, um, one of the things that I flashed by quickly um, as part of a, uh, is, a, is in these sets of tools, um, we have some tools for doing gradebook analytics, and then within that doing analytics of particular assignments. And a great way to get an investigation started like that is to, to probe what's particularly hard in your course. Um, uh, the, uh, when you find, for example, one of our chemistry collaborators found that he had these certain equilibrium problems that only about 25% of students got right. That's a great thing then, then to start doing these CTAs with like uh, think aloud studies where they had graduate students doing think aloud solving these problems, comparing them to novices solving these same problems. 
those qualitative methods are really powerful. Um, the relationship between instructional design and learning analytics is super important. Um, uh, I, I think that uh, as the questioner asks, can the latter be developed, uh, that is learning in analytics independent of strong intentionality from the former, um, I don't think they can be done very effectively in independently. At least you need a team of experts. It helps to have folks that uh, you know, know uh, advanced analytic techniques you know there's a lot of great research in machine learning on deep learning for example but i see a lot of work that uh, produces better predictions without producing insights for instructional design and i totally agree with the questioner's implication here that these need to be brought together um uh and we're certainly working to uh, provide ways to do that. Um, uh, uh, I think attending to uh, course redesign efforts at the start and at the end of an analytic cycle is part of a way to bring those uh, more closely together. Ah, this is an interesting question. Uh, comments on the effects of different representations of identical math problems suggest that learning analytics may become design analytics, or at least that statistically we might measure design eff efficacy. Yeah, I guess that's, I, uh, I think it's related to the previous question. I guess I, I think about learning analytics as design analytics. Um, uh, um, I think measuring design efficacy um, is super important. And uh, I think what's also important is that we can't wait to do these big randomized field trials to learn something. And because so many of those big randomized field trials come out with no difference. Um, the Department of Education's run over the past 20, 30 years, uh, like, you know, at least 100 of those multi-million dollar kinds of studies and maybe about 10% come out significant. We need better methods to, to get results early. Um, and so smaller scale experiments um, and, you know, and even taking the risk of correlation isn't cause um, is worthwhile to gain good data informed hypotheses to, to guide design. Uh, another common how you succeed in professional life, indeed. Uh, uh, but higher education life is not designed that way. Do you think LA might play a role in reforming institutionalized higher education? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, that's part of what our Simon Initiative at CMU has been engaged in doing and making better connections between the re you know, we have a large set of faculty, especially in, in the department I'm in human computer interaction that does learning science and technology development. But we also have a teaching and learning center and they talk very that we interact uh, on a nearly weekly basis uh, to bring our science to bear to, as I like to say, drink our own champagne. Um, it, and it's not easy, I think, uh, it goes to issues of how faculty are promoted and, and, um, and it goes to, you know, often we, the data we use is the data that's easiest to collect like student evaluations. There's lots of literature now that suggests circumstances in which what a student's perception of their learning and the actual learning uh, can often be opposite. So active versus passive learning. There's a great 2019 study by Desla Race in, in the Panis journal that shows exactly this interaction. Um, yeah, so I, I think we need reform in, in institutions of higher ed to provide incentives for this kind of approach. Um, and uh, um, we, we, there are examples I think of success out there and, and tools to help move it forward. Did I miss any questions, Kathy? No, I think you got every single one of them. I can't hear you. You may be muted. 
Okay, can you hear me now? Oh, sorry. Not a problem. Yes, you got every single question and you are well within time. Thank you so much. Are there any further questions from our audience? I'll monitor it for just a minute or two more. Uh, I apologize if you were talking earlier and I couldn't hear you. Uh, I just realized my computer was on mute. Not, not a problem. It is. I think that is the end of the questions and I wanna thank you for a lovely keynote on our second day, Ken. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Kathy. Thank you, Melissa, for the wonderful introduction. Have a great uh, interaction, everybody.